My mum has Alzheimer's and she's registered blind. Her carer was doing a cracking job. She actually had to move in because my mum needs 24 hour care. So I was working away, doing my life, but still seeing mum quite regularly. And then the carer said, I'm sorry, but I have to go back to my family. My landlord's actually a really good friend of mine. Um, I moved in with him because he's 90 years old to sort of look after him. So, I moved in. There was myself and my dog. We suddenly had to decamp from where I lived, a lovely little cottage with a garden, to my mum's two bedroom flat in Oxford city centre. And then they announced the lockdown. Life for me before the lockdown was really rather strange. I had been married for 61 years. My husband had died and uh, I had moved from the village where we had lived for 41 years to be nearer to the heart of Oxford, which meant that I could come to my most favorite place, the Ashmolean Museum. And actually, it turned out the other way around. Um, just before Christmas, I had a chest X-ray and um, in January, I got a diagnosis of terminal cancer. So I've been living in his attic in the heat and uh, actually I wasn't really living. I was just basically trying to survive, not living at all. I was just trying to stay alive. And I'd be going from my chair all day straight to my bed without eating because um, I had no energy. I love to sit amongst the Impressionists. And then I would go to films and theatre. And then along comes COVID-19. That kind of being alone was very different from the being alone I was trying to get used to before. No, I'd become aware that I could disappear and very few people would know. I live alone. Uh, I lost my partner to cancer just over a year ago. So it really brought home to me just how lonely I am, to be honest. I moved in to my mum's spare room. I'm also in the high risk group, I'm a diabetic. And so me and my mum are both pretty much on the list where you lock yourself in and that's it for the next however long. So not only did I have to worry about my mum, I had to worry about the dog. And just to complete the three steps to hell, I was on the list for emergency surgery. Oxford Together, the Oxford Hub. I kind of signed up for that because I felt I was in a position to offer some sort of assistance. As I say, I live alone, so there's little chance of me bumping into people and, and picking up the bug. The CEO at the Oxford Hub had an idea to put a call out for volunteers uh, in case we went into lockdown in early March. And within a space of five days, it did. We had enormous numbers of people signing up to volunteer. Normally, we place 850 uh, volunteers in a year, and we had 2,000 within a few weeks. I'm relatively new to the council. I think it's fair to say it was all quite chaotic. At first, there was no planning of what the day would involve or what you'd be doing. It was just respond, respond, respond. In those first few weeks, it felt really overwhelming and like a huge, quite scary undertaking. I didn't really know what I was doing. I had no previous training to deal with this. I started working on the street championing stuff, the community. The first thing to mobilise was getting people in touch with all their neighbours, getting people into WhatsApp groups, and making sure for those who didn't have access to WhatsApp, they could also be involved, 
she just start building this local sense of community. Oxford Together made it fairly easy to get involved with the volunteering. It's sort of the volunteering version of pay what you can. It's been good to encounter an ethos that says, you don't have to give us everything, just give us a little bit. Everyone is giving a little bit. And then that becomes enough. I think it's fundamentally changed what we do with the city because we have these new working relationships. I think we need to take these lessons forward of working across teams more without so much hierarchy, adopting initiatives really fast and dropping what doesn't work and, and to build on the relationships that we've made with residents. I think it's a model for the future. And I think it's so important to work collaboratively across sectors and departments and to build these relationships before you actually need them. So when there was a need for food supplies and prescription pickups, the council wasn't, oh, what budget's that gonna come out of? Or whose job is that? Or which department? It was more like, right, who's best set up to solve this problem? Well, well, it's the Oxford Hub, it's the food bank, it's whatever. I get the feeling that the council were being called by more organisations, but then the council were calling on more organisations to help solve the problem. I think the voluntary sector relationships have been great. And we've met so many people in other areas that well, I personally wouldn't have known before or had a relationship with. And now I feel that I have a contact that I can phone for advice or ask, can we collaborate together? It's been really useful. Well, the services are going straight to the people who need them. There's less stepping stones. You know, like, oh, sorry, the person you need to speak to is on annual leave. You can't speak to them for two weeks. That's normal. At the moment, it's sort of, OK, well, we'll get back to you. And then within a day, something's happened. <laughs> I, th I think the most creative thing I've seen is, well, the ability not to hide behind processes and, and procedures and just get things done. A man called the Oxford Hub said he'd received his food shop uh, because he was isolating and that was all fine. But he needed a particular type of lettuce for his tortoise and that hadn't come with the food shop. So. A, a volunteer was sent on a hunt to six different supermarkets because it couldn't be iceberg and it couldn't be romaine. It had to be a round lettuce because his tortoise was very fussy. <laughs> I finally found the right number by somebody saying, I know somebody in the hub, why don't you ring them? I was trying to get somebody to come in just for a couple of hours while I was in hospital for my mum and the dog. And that's how they came on board. They said, don't worry, we'll put a shout out to all the local dog um, walkers. And four different people popped their heads up and they said, we'll walk her. These guys from the Oxford District Services came and spent two weeks building my beautiful cabin. And then they painted it. It's changed my life, basically. And my friend's happy because it means I spend a lot more time downstairs. And then when he's in his garden, we can have a chat. So it's benefited him as well, really. <laughs> One day, I got a telephone call. It was from Oxford Together, asking me how I was and was I getting everything that I needed. I was so relieved, I cannot tell you. That was the moment when I felt like somebody out there was actually listening to me, genuinely from their hearts. She rings me up if she hasn't heard from me for about 10 days. And if I don't want anything, we just go on and have a chat. We talked last night for an hour. I said to her, isn't it absolutely wonderful, the good things that have come out of COVID-19? <laughs> and you'd wonder if anything good could come out of that. But something has. I have met a number of 
very nice people. I've seen parts of Oxford that I would never have gone to otherwise. I think I'm learning a little bit more about other people's lives in a way that I hadn't expected. It's a period of such isolation and yet I feel I have a much better sense of how people in this city live. This makes me very proud of Oxford. What is wonderful is that you have a city council who says, well, do this, well, make this kind of organisation, but it will be manned entirely by volunteers. The whole thing is built on trust. If I didn't trust the person who was contacting me, I couldn't have accepted the help that I got. It's been good for me, knowing that I can contribute, knowing that I'm, I'm giving something. It gives you a great sense of well-being, you know, because it's a two-way street. Someone benefits from someone else giving, and the person giving benefits from knowing that they're contributing, not just sitting on their jacksy and letting the world go by. My sense of what constitutes a big life and a small life is markedly different now. When someone lives a small life, it's a life that is community-based. You're not globetrotting or influencing policy all over the world, but you might make the lives of people around you better. I think it's amazing that they could go so far above and beyond just for me. I mean, I thought getting support would mean, you know, if you couldn't get your shopping in or something, you'd get help with that. For the first time in a very long time, somebody was actually doing something to help me. Now that was better than somebody saying, you've won the lottery. The heavens opened and I felt like, thank you. Somebody's coming to my rescue. <laughs>